What is up guys and welcome back to the Coasters Unscripted Podcast. I'm your host Andrew from Coaster Thrills joined by my co-host Caleb from back at the barnyard Hayride Thrills. Caleb, how you doing today? I'm doing fantastic as always Andrew. Uh, today was great. Um, I got some new credits today at Fun Spot Orlando. Uh, we started at Universal, maybe some foreshadowing for earlier or later in the episode, but uh, we're filming this pretty late at night right now. It's two o'clock in the morning and I'm tired as you can hear in my voice, but we're still going. Yeah, we are. <laughs> we, as you can tell, we're recording this episode very late. It is approximately like at the moment, it is two o'clock in the morning and in like six hours, we're getting up to go to Bush Gardens, which... That's uh, even more exciting. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty short night of sleep there, but yeah. We can do it. We're coaster enthusiasts. We can do anything. To be honest, I probably only get four hours of sleep because this episode is we're still, like we're just starting right now, so we're gonna not like get, not to get that much sleep. I mean, and you still have to edit this too. And... Yeah, I mean, we're getting this out today. Like it is two in the morning, but we got to get this out at six p.m. today. So. There's that challenge, of the biggest challenge of the day. And we're going to be at Busch Gardens all day. It's so weird to say today. Like I feel like we should say, instead of just saying, we'll be at Busch Gardens all day, we should say, we're going to be at Iron Gwazi all day. Yes. Like, that's something that's really like weird, because like anytime I go to ride Iron Gwazi, I don't feel like... It's real. Yeah, I, I definitely don't feel like it's real, but I don't feel like... I'm in, like, Bush Gardens, Tampa. I just feel like I'm in a secluded area of the park that's just specifically for Iron Gwazi, mainly due to Passport of the Rills, because, like, that was really, like, a secluded area of the park that everybody, such as enthusiasts and stuff, were there. I mean, it really just felt secluded from, you know, the rest of the park. I didn't really feel like I was in Bush Gardens, Tampa, you know? Yeah, I get that same exact feeling I know, Andrew. Uh, that... It definitely does feel like it's secluded, especially with it being only exclusively pass holders right now. Uh, I know a lot of people who have actually been there and have really wanted to ride Gwazi, and it's either closed or they can't do it because they're not good enough pass holders uh, or not upgraded enough, as I should say, not elite enough to do it yet. But I mean, at least now they... I mean, it's now getting to the time where they are getting more people in, the, they're lowering the pass holders, and it's going to open, like, very soon. Currently, as we're recording this, it is uh, Jan- uh, not January, February 27th, so on March 11th is when it'll open, so uh, the days are counting counting towards it, um, and soon everybody's going to get to ride it. I just can't imagine, like... How long the line's going to be, how packed BGT yeah. is going to be. We were there on the first day of Passover previews, and the line for Gwazi was just ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, take for instance, Hagrid's. Like, when that thing opened, it had, like, the longest line ever. Pretty much anything Universal does, but... Or Disney. Or Disney. Yeah, very very much Disney. Disney is very well known for that, but... Uh, yeah, a lot of these parks, just like, especially Florida, just like, when their coasters open for brand new, like... The lines are just ridiculously long. Like Hagrid's is like, how long was that? Like, I think it was eight hours was its re- was its maximum reached, and then also Seven Dwarfs Mine Train during even just soft openings. I went whenever it was soft opening the first day it soft opened. It literally wrapped around the whole ride three times. That is around ins- that insane. entire ride. Just imagine that. Yeah, that is absolutely insane. Like, I remember waiting in that line for Seven Dwarfs. It was only around it once. I can't imagine waiting, like, three times, especially for the ride the Seven Dwarfs delivers, you know? It's not the best. It's pretty short. I wouldn't wait that long for that short of a ride. Like, yeah. It's, I mean, some parts of it are good. It has, like, it has the interactive element. The animatronics are, like, very nice. They look very well, very nice. But um, The drop in the back row, depending on the day and how well it's run, can actually deliver some solid floater. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, and also, like the, something is like I think is just really cool about the ride is the way the trains move, like the way they just go back and forth. I just really like that element to it. They don't really go back and forth that much, it, unless your whole car does it. Yes, that that, that could definitely result in some nice, some nice laterals. tilting laterals, laterals. You could say that or forces, pretty much. Like, but if you, let's say you have, like, just almost no people or just nobody, like, doing it in, like, 
it's hard, very, very, very hard to move it if yeah. you have that situation. Yeah. I mean, mainly it's just doesn't really notice it. I mean, I remember the first time I wrote it, I didn't even notice it at all. Like, it, it was something I just didn't even like go on about until recently. But it was hey. a little pass holder tip at that point. Yeah, at that point. But now it's, I mean, it's grown to something bigger. So, speaking of Disney. I just went to Disney on Friday, which was two days ago from now, but I just went back two three di- days. Three days. Di- no, two days. Two days? Uh, yeah, two days. I'm, sorry. I'm so tired right now. <laughs> I know. We're, we're both tired, but yeah, it's, it's Sunday now, so. Uh, but I just went back to Epcot, which words cannot describe how excited I was. I got to ride Spaceship Earth, Rider 2E, and uh, Mission Space Greenside. It's okay, though. But I got to go back there. It's the first time since uh, I've been at Disney since May 2021, which that just tells you, I mean, I was dying to go back, and I finally got a Pixie Dust Pass, so that was really nice. I am so glad I get to go there more often now, especially... On the weekdays, um, what I'm going to try to do, especially uh, especially with Caleb too, um, since I got the pixie dust, you can only go on the weekdays, so I'm thinking about going, always going on Disney on the weekdays when I have time available, and then, you know, saving parks like the SeaWorld Parks and Universal for the weekends, I think that's what I'm looking at right now, but and there's also some, you know, other coasters opening, like outside of Florida, so we'll just have to see how that goes. Mm-hmm. Area Force One being one of those that we are both really excited for. Yeah, there's so many good coasters opening soon, like Area Force One, Pantheon, which is opening Literally very soon. Opening like this week. Yeah, I mean Tomb Beely, I mean I'm personally excited for that Tomb Beely. I, I don't know why I'm excited for it, it's just but another the, free spin. it's just another free spin. But I feel like it's it'll be such a good addition for King's Dominion. I mean, and you know like. The theming that will go with it. Cedar Fair is like obviously like not too in depth of theming, but I feel like they'll do something pretty special for what they have done, like they're compared doing, to what they have done they're before. Doing stuff around that area, a lot of stuff around that area with uh, theming, retheming their bobsled. They're doing that, and then getting a new restaurant in that area near it too. So they're making the effort to move back to theming, or not back to, but towards theming. You know, yeah, I mean, I, I like the way King's Dominion is going. It's the only thing that's not the best for them is their competitor is doing fantastic as well. Bush Gardens, Williamsburg. Bush Gardens Williamsburg. Yeah. He's just knocking it out of the park with every addition they add. And Pantheon will be no exception to that. To think how stacked that lineup could be when they have Pantheon, which will be opening very soon. But also, Dragonspire. if that happens. That would just make their lineup even better. I am so excited for what both of the Virginia parks have for in the future. I know we think of ourselves as spoiled, like as our land enthusiasts, but seriously, like Williamsburg and like in that whole area of Virginia, they are really getting some good parks. They have two very, very good parks, and uh, they have some really good coasters. Uh, I mean, think about this: like the top three in that state will be Pantheon. Twisted Timbers, and I-305. That is just crazy to me, even though we live in Florida, which Florida has a great top three as well. But but yeah, I mean, like, it is just crazy how many good coasters are coming in 2022. Uh, it's just really crazy. Like, a lot of these additions started, like, to be rumored, or they were, like, originally announced to be for 2020. But since it's, like, COVID and all of that stuff, it's really just resulted in delayed openings i mean obviously we saw that 2020 2021 22 all of that but 2022 i think is looking to be a super good year it's just i don't know I mean, there's just so many good attractions i mean iron guazi is already open which is insane i mean we have we have iron guazi pantheon emperor tumbili airy force one there's so much that you could go off of to make 2022 a great year. It's 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 really insane. Like the amusement industry is is definitely uh, bouncing back from this COVID and coming back stronger than ever. Nobody probably could have expected this to happen at such an alarming rate. I mean, it only took about a year to, you know, for the, for the parks to be really crowded again for everything to go back on its feet you know we start getting new coaster openings again you know the excitement for the amusement industry finally has picked back up yeah i mean it's 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 really great because like 
SeaWorld is really bouncing back. They've had some great success recently, and we're seeing that with their already starting Project Penguin, which it's great that Project Penguin is starting to get built because that was rumored for like 2021, which I know if you watched the last episode, I gave more detail on that, but it's great that they're actually like even making like even more coasters and starting to make progress on those new projects that were originally planned. Hopefully, maybe just maybe soon that they start to make progress on... Uh, you know, the Sewell at San Diego one. Uh, they were rumored to get another Intamin, not another, but another multi-launch. So, an Intamin multi-launch. I think that'll be a good fit. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. I mean... Or even maybe a mock power splash. A mock power splash would be good. Uh, I feel like a mock power splash would be something like Sewell would li- like really like to clone, you know? Like, I feel like if they did the turntable and they, like, clone those to many of the parks, they would make some good fits. I mean... They do already have water coasters in Journey to Atlantis, but hey. It would be it would be a lot more different from Journey to Atlantis that I think it would I think it would be a good fit for the park. And it would be another launch coaster for them. Yeah, but to complement Icebreaker. Yeah, something I really think would be really cool is if y'all don't know, there is a new SeaWorld Park going to a uh, United Arab Emirates, which in the Middle East, so they're may building a new SeaWorld Park and Something I think that would be a really good fit is a mock power splash, their version of Journey to Atlantis. That would be great. Uh, obviously, they probably won't go with an uh, like uh, an original mock water coaster. If they do that, go with the Journey to Atlantis route. Uh, I feel like they would probably do more of like what's been more trendy. You know, like a mock power splash. I mean, Six Flags Over Texas and. Uh, at Wallaby, Belgium. Uh, those are some mock power splashes. So. Or they might go with the mock power splash that has a loop in it. <laughs> that would be... That would be an interesting addition. I mean, I mean who knows? Because that new sewer park, they have a huge budget. And with that huge budget, they could do so much stuff. Like It has th- untapped potential. Yeah, very much untapped potential. They could build the uh, like Sea Life... To be really nice. Like, some aquariums would be really cool. Imagine if they made, like, the world's biggest aquarium. Probably not. There's probably a bad record taken, but... Yeah. yeah. But I feel like they can make, like, so many cool stuff. I mean, obviously, like, they don't have that... They have a big budget. The same with, like, six, like the Six Flags Quidia, which hopefully that happens, but they obviously have a massive budget. Like Falcon's Flight just looks too good to be true. I'll just say that. And it's really good that these parks are getting, like like, bigger budgets, and, like, with bigger budgets mean, like, these chains, bigger, and bigger, and bigger coasters and stuff, but what, what this really means is that, like, these parks are really recovering, like, really recovering, getting back to the point that, like, since COVID, like, now, like, more than ever, like, parks are getting back to normal, and it's really great for the amusement industry that all of this is happening. I mean, I mean, yeah, there are some downsides, uh, some coasters not opening, <coughs> top of the dragster, but, uh, you know, but I mean, hey, I mean, we'll just have to wait and see, uh, but really, like, overall, the amusement industry has been doing really nice recently. Don't you agree, Caleb? Yes, I would very much agree. Uh, yeah, but with that comes a lot of news, and we have a lot of news for this episode. Uh, so let's get into the next segment, the news. Uh, to start off, our first bit of news since the last episode, coming to Hershey Park, we have jolly rancher remix and another one of his little flat rides uh caleb what do you think of this i think that this would be a good addition to hershey park it's definitely a refresh of the boomerang and the flat ride will be a good welcome addition i mean it wasn't really like a needed addition at least i haven't been to hershey park so i don't know what it feels like there uh but it feels like they have enough like flat rides maybe with the Hershey triple shot and the uh, what other flat rides do they have there? <laughs> there's like a Falcon one or something. There's there's lots of. Uh, Don't they but, have a Ferris wheel there? Ferris wheel, yeah, yeah. I I've been to Hershey Park, so I think I'm no more than Caleb. <laughs> he was like disappointed, but <laughs> I'm very disappointed. I need the credits. <laughs> I've been there three times, so I don't know how I feel about this. Uh, it's I think it'll be decent. Um, I don't know. Uh, the color scheme is definitely out there, but hey, it's Hershey Park. They got a theme of stuff to candy in, am I right? Mm-hmm. I mean, with Candemonium, now Jolly Ranchers. I mean, I mean, now we're getting to the true Hershey Park, you know? <laughs> but... Storm Runner being rethemed. To Reese's. Reese's Cup Rush. 
<laughs> Reese's Storm thing. Rush. There's already two Reese's themed That's rides true. in the park. But they, could, they, they don't have to repaint it. They could go Twizzlers Storm Rush. Twizzler. <laughs> they can name it a Twizzler. Or maybe, if, or maybe something like Rock Candy or Pop Rocks. There's, it's not a specific brand, though. I, I, I'm just trying to think of something that would represent the launch and the power of Storm Runner. I mean... What do you think would be a good brand, maybe, for that? Oh, no. Right now, I'm looking up, like, anything like the uh, Almond Joy. Almond Joy Blast from the Past. <laughs> <laughs> Payday. Time to pay. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> no, that, wait. That just, I, I don't think that name would fly at her wait. <laughs> The Payday Rush. And the slogan would be, it's time to pay. Within... With a launch. <laughs> but yeah, we're getting off track. We're going unscripted. You know what we're doing. That's what the whole podcast is about, you know? But yeah, back to what we were talking about with the Jolly Rancher remix. Obviously, there's also that new flat ride. Uh, any flat ride is probably good. Um, I've personally never done one of these. Uh, I don't think Caleb has either, but. There was one at IAPA. Yeah, there was one at IAPA. We gotta go to IAPA soon, but like we do. None, of, both of us have not been to IAPA yet, so yeah, we're thinking about going next just, year. Next year, I'm, I mean, I'm like ninety nine percent sure I'm going next year. What do you mean next year? Like November? Wait, wait, like in November. I'm in going, November, yes. I'm going in November. Yeah, that's what we're planning on. Uh, we have I have Ace membership. Uh, so that could Ace membership is really good. I mean, definitely recommend it. I've been an Ace member for. About going, we're going on two years right now. Uh, going on three years. So, um, yeah. I mean, I love being a member of Ace, but we're getting off topic again. Of course, we're going unscripted. But uh, back to the flat ride. Um, I've seen it at some parks before. Uh, I mean, it looks good. I I don't think it's anything special. I've seen the concept. It looks really cool. Uh, I think it would definitely add to the look and the atmosphere of the whole area. I think it would be just be another thing to get families. Some more experience, uh, but you know, back to the, with the, with the boomerang. Um, just for me, I don't know. Like the colors just seem a little out there, but you know, it's Hershey Park. We'll have to see what happens. But I'm sure it'll grow in me, uh, especially when you see it in person. But it, it definitely will look a lot brighter from the brown, wasn't it? Wasn't it brown? Yeah, it was. It was pretty much like very, very, very dark gray and like faded white. That's pretty much what it was. Uh, yeah, I feel like the bright, what is it, light green? Yeah, it's it's, it's I feel like parks out there with a lot more brighter color schemes. Like for example, we saw Kraken get that kind of uh, repaint from the from the dark or not darker, but from a lighter well, teal to like almost like green. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's not as bright, but like or like Montu. Montu, but that's yeah, that is more bright. I will agree with that. It, Montu it like looks like Goliath that. Uh, yeah. What is it Fiesta Texas? Yeah, Fiesta Texas. It's like a navy blue and a mustard yellow. <laughs> it's like the way to describe the colors of that thing. Uh, I mean, you know, definitely parks are going with like a brighter like color scheme and stuff. But which I mean, it's a nice change from darker. But I mean, you know how how much, especially like some of those coasters in the Florida heat, especially and humidity. How long will that bright color scheme last? Is the question that I mean, uh, only time will tell. I mean, yeah, that is a very good point. But um, I mean, it's 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 it's, it's whatever's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. But uh, I mean, personally, I did like the old Sidewinders colors. I don't like it's nothing too like out there. It's very simple. It's not really original, but it's just very simple. I I did like it though. Uh, Sidewinder is one of my favorite boomerangs just because. Oh, the fact that it does have those uh, new, uh, it already, like, even before Jolly Rancher, it has those uh, new Vacoma restraints, the over-shoulder restraints, the Which more best can, restraints. I can testify to this one. I've been on Flying Cobras at Carowinds with those new uh, over-the-shoulder restraints from Vacoma, and my gosh, those restraints are actually really comfortable, and they don't... There's no head banging at all. You know, the only thing is, if you're a bigger guy or girl or whoever you might be, bigger, it it might bother you a little bit. But for me, uh, it didn't really bother me that much. And I thought uh, flying cobras was actually a really intense and 
fun boomerang. I mean, can I say that? Yeah, I mean, is that legal? <laughs> I know. Like the contrast between like the old boomerangs and the new brain boomerangs is so like, like massive. Like it, like it, it's so it's such a different ride. You know, like the old boomerangs are just terrible in my opinion. Like they get so annoying when you have to ride them, and it's just. I don't know, and it's so nice that these parks, especially, even with the SLCs, that they're getting these new restraints for the coasters, and they're making them even just way better. I mean, this, obviously Flying Cobras, they are such way better rides with those restraints. They're almost like good rides with how intense they are. And also, you can see that the SLCs, I mean, like, Great Nor'easter is a fantastic ride, and that has the new old shoulder restraints that I know, I know that before... It had those restraints. It was probably terrible, just like every other SLC. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Caleb is not yet to I, do I one. I have been very fortunate enough so far to have not run into an SLC. Which, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I, can I call myself a coaster enthusiast before I ride one of those? Uh, no. <laughs> I'll just go out there and say yeah, Say that, no. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I haven't encountered a park with one yet. So. Yeah. I mean... I know, I know. I mean, SLCs are bad, like, when you ride them, but, like, I feel like if you haven't ridden one, you, like, you want to ride them almost. Like, do you want to ride it? I I know it's, like, a terrible ride, but I feel like you just want to ride it. Maybe I should start out with the worst in T3. If you call that the worst. <laughs> okay, fine. Mind Eraser at... Which Mind Eraser? <laughs> Lich Gardens. There we go. Yeah, that one, or my, my my least favorite, like, I have two least favorite SLCs. Those are the ones at Darien Lake and Canada's Wonderland. Like, Flight Deck and Mind Eraser, those are atrocious. Those are unbearably rough. Everything about them is bad, but... Credit and forget it. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, there's that. But let's move on to the next bit of news. Uh, here we have Six Flags Magic Mountain rolling out with their new virtual queue system, which... I don't know that much about it. Caleb, what do you think about it? So I saw a post on social media from somebody that apparently before COVID, Six Flags Magic Mountain had been testing out this new virtual queue system right before the shutdown happened. And so they tested it out and apparently it went well and so they probably developed it more. And so basically what it enables you to do is basically skip the line for free for one ride of your choice so let's say you go on the app and get a thing for Twisted Colossus. And so you can reserve your time and then go up to the, what is it, Flash Pass entrance of the ride and show them that and then you're good to go. And so I think this is a very welcome addition. I love how Six Flags is trying out new things to improve the guest experience, especially with waiting in long lines and especially at Six Flags, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that like to try to get around those lines and try to skip the lines. And so it makes it a lot more enjoyable with those virtual queue systems. And it works out for the park as well because the fact that people will be spending more time in shops, eating food, you know, going around the park instead of waiting in a line for two hours. I mean, yeah, I feel like this is the future. Uh, I feel like a lot of parks will, if this happens and... It is a success at Six Flags Magic Mountain. I feel like a lot of parks will learn from that, and I think they will really try to like adapt that into their system. And I feel like it will be really good for all the guests and stuff, especially for us coast enthusiasts. Even for me, like it'll be great for me because we can just go get pictures, photos, like footage, all of that. Like while you're still waiting in line, while you're still waiting in line, which. That could definitely come in handy with Universal, because some of the rides, such as Hulk and, you know, Rip Around Rocket, like, they have metal detectors at the beginning of the line. So you're sitting in that line, let's say it's a two-hour line, you're sitting in that line for two hours, nothing to do without your phone. The only thing you could do is have fun with your friends, which that is that was something you that could is, do. Mm, let's just say less boring after a while. But, yeah, but... But it, it, it would really be great, like, just to get more stuff done if you have stuff to do, like, get photos and footage, which, it's just, I think like, it's just really good. It really is the future, in my opinion. I feel like if it's a success at Six Flags Magic Mountain, it really could go into more parks, and they could we could just see what happens. I feel like it would be a great thing for all these parks to adapt into their system. The only thing I don't like about it is how Disney attacked it with Rise of the Resistance and Ratatouille. 
I don't like how they had a limited amount of the virtual queue and that it did not go all day, that you had to get up at either 7 o'clock in the morning to get one or you had to be in the park at 1 o'clock. I did not like that one bit. I just would like it to be a free, like hassle-free type of thing that you would able to use, would be able to, you know, make one whenever you casually feel like it, and one time, you know, maybe one time per ride per day, and then maybe have like a separate standby line or single rider line or whatever line, and you'd still have your flash pass and all that stuff. Um, I just feel like, you know, that would be the way to do it is a little bit more hassle free and a little bit less exclusive, I should say. But speaking about Disney, let's move on to our next bit of the news. We have uh, the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser. That thing just opened and it's definitely, it's an interesting subject to talk about. It's it's a ripoff. It's really a ripoff. I think it was a good idea, bad execution. Very bad execution. If you want, you are paying six thousand dollars. Yeah, you heard me right. That is six grand to go into this two day thing. That the rooms, like the rooms, like for six thousand bucks. Like, come on, I, I get the whole experience. Like, it feels claustrophobic almost. Those rooms look claustrophobic yeah everything about it even like the experience even like throughout the whole thing i don't have that much to say about it but like the experience throughout the whole thing doesn't look the best i mean obviously caleb and i have not done it uh yet i probably will never do this in my life unless they bump down the prices which hopefully they do nor will i probably ever do it yeah but like i just don't know off the videos i've seen it's just not like something I would be willing to do, especially with all the characters just not being, like, like, if I'm paying, like, $6,000, it's hard to explain, but I kind of want, like, the cast to be, like, look more like the characters. I don't know. It's something I'm just going off of, but, like... sound more like the characters. Yeah, like, yeah, like, Kylo Ren, like, you're talking about Kylo Ren, like, I don't think he's... I I didn't really listen to that much, but, Caleb, you said... From what I heard, I watched about... I watched Tim Tracker's video about 80 minutes into it and right up to the point where they had the lightsaber battle and Kylo Ren did not sound like Kylo Ren at all. I'll just say that. Uh, And so did Ray. Ray did not sound like Ray. It was almost like an impression and it was a try towards it, but it wasn't fully Ray. You know, I wasn't really convinced. Yeah. And also with myself not being the biggest fan of the sequel trilogy, uh, I'm just not into it. I mean, I get some of it's cool and stuff. Though, I mean, they do have lightsaber fight. I think that was cool. But, like, I'm just not, like, the biggest fan of the sequel trilogy and everything that goes along with it. I'm more of a fan of, like, you know, the OG trilogy and, of course, the prequels. I mean, I'm not going to go into too depth into Star Wars, but I'm a fan of the prequels. Get mad at me all you want, but I like the prequels. I like the original trilogy, too, but, like, the hey, thing yeah. come out of the trilogies or not trilogies but like only thing that's come out of the separate disney made uh star wars films has been the mandalorian i think that was definitely one of the big successes that disney has done with the star wars franchise yeah just imagine if what disney did imagine if they did the mandalorian Everything that was successful about the Mandalorian went off on new things. Like they have uh, Obi Wan Kenobi, uh, the new show coming out, which I'm so excited for that. Uh, it, I'm, it's I'm gonna ex- be interesting yeah. to see how it stacks up to the other Star Wars films Disney has made. I mean, come on, I don't know about you, but I'm just excited to see Hayden Christensen as Anakin again, uh, and obviously Obi Wan is too. But like, those are some of my favorite characters in all of Star Wars. I mean, come on, but like. I'm just excited to see those, but imagine if they just did those type of shows, but and they took their time with doing the original trilogy. Uh, they had the same. Imagine if they just had the same ideas, not all like spread like out and just, uh, like messed up and everything. With like the two directors in both J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson, uh, it was really messed up, and they both had both the directors had different objectives with how they wanted to tell the story and the spirit behind like the whole film and stuff, but I don't know, it's just, I feel like Disney kind of 
screwed all of Star Wars and the sequel trilogy, which... Other than Mandalorian. Other than Mandalorian, yes. Nice. Which is odd, like, in my opinion, because Disney, like, does everything well, and I feel like just what they've done with the Star Wars sequel trilogy has not been good. Like, I mean, come on, there's the MCU, all of that. MCU is my absolute favorite. They've done that absolutely perfectly, but Star Wars, just not it for them, in my opinion. Yeah, they had their hits and misses with that, definitely, and I feel like the Star Wars Hotel has definitely been uh, mostly a miss. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry for y'all who's just coming, like, coast enthusiasts coming here to, like, listen I mean, about coasters, but here we are talking about Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> and, and the new hotel, I mean, we gotta spice up this podcast just I know. a little bit, you know? I mean, come on, we aren't just coaster enthusiasts, we're... Everything coaster th- coaster enthusiasts were everything and most we're mostly coaster enthusiasts, but we are other passions too. Like Disney, yeah, Disney but, being one of them. Yes, yes. But back to our another bit of news. Uh, this time we're moving to an actual amusement park chain. This is Cedar Fair, and what they have been doing. Uh, not all the parks, only two so far. Hopefully, it's uh only these two, but. Uh, California's Great America and Valley Fair have done something that I hope no other park does. They have I, removed, I they yeah, I, they have removed their Halloween haunt events, which they're replacing with some trick or treat thing. But I am just not excited. Just, I I just not a fan of this. Uh, some of my favorite times of the year is when these places and all these parks have haunts. Like Halloween Horror Nights is the perfect example. Halloween Horror Nights is world class, and I feel like. When really any park does this type of stuff, it is. I'm a big fan of them. And I know you are too, Caleb. It's Yes, I've been out to Halloween Horror Nights and both Hollow Screams at SeaWorld and at Bush Gardens. And I'm just going to tell you that those events are some of the most fun times of the year. I mean, there is a little bit of uh, debatable, you know, situations and a debatable, you know, behavior of the guests during those times of the year. However, uh, you know, basically they're doing the opposite. I wish they did what SeaWorld Orlando did with their spooktacular during the day and then Hollow Scream at night. I wish they would do that instead of completely overriding the whole thing just for a family event. That really is a, a very good compromise. SeaWorld really, with what they did with Howl's Scream, they really did that perfectly. I mean, you really have everything in that event. You have Mako, a fantastic ride, open late. You get some great night rides on that. You have a great flat ride, in, kind of flat ride, in uh, Infinity Falls, which is great. It's another great ride they have there. Uh, they had four houses, uh, some great scare zones. Uh, and they had that, you know, trick or treat thing earlier in the day, which I feel like that is the absolute perfect compromise. Uh, and it's really sad to see that these parks, such as Valley Fair and California's Great America, are doing this stuff. Uh, it's just, in my opinion, I hope other parks just don't do that. Um, I'm just a really big fan of like the houses and stuff that they do. But you know, if you look at it from a certain perspective, you can kind of understand like what situation they were in, and what they're trying to do. I mean, I know they have to. Maybe cut down the budget a little bit of what they're doing, uh, especially with Cedar Fair. They are not in the best situation right now, but, you know, I'm just not the biggest fan in general. I mean, I get what they're, like, they're trying to go for, and I get, like, why they're doing it, but I don't know. It's just not, I'm just not the biggest fan of it, you know? I think they're thinking that they can pull more money in by attracting families to the park and not having wild teenagers run around getting scared a bunch of times. I mean, at least, and at least we're talking. At least we're only uh, saying this about Valley Fair in California's Great America. Yes, Wait. and not like Cedar Point, Kings Island, you know those big parks. I mean, yeah, let's hope. I mean, Cedar Point has not been the best lately, but I mean, hey. We'll just have to wait and see. Hopefully it just doesn't change, you know? It's just those midnight rides on Steel Vengeance that might make it, uh... It might make it just just, just a hair better, you know? Yeah. I'm the best coaster in the world. <laughs> but, uh, that's, wait, an oh, yeah. that's an opinion, Andrew. Oh, that's, that's, that's a fact, actually. No, uh, but not. moving on to the next segment. We uh, Not segment. What am I saying? We have the next bit of news. This is Dr. Diabolical's Cliffhanger. And guess what? That thing just got topped off. That construction of that thing has been insane. They're they are doing so good. Uh, 
I mean, hopefully we'll get to ride it this summer, but they have been doing so good at the construction of thing. They've already built the lift hill. They've already topped it off, and that drop looks... I mean, it's a dive coaster drop, but it looks great, in my opinion. I think this coaster will be not, not the best in the world, but I feel like it will deliver a great experience, especially if they do some theme with it. I am really excited to see what Six Flags Fiesta Texas can pull off. Yes, and I'm very excited to be riding this this summer, actually, on our Texas road trip. And so... I mean, yeah. <laughs> going to Roller Coaster Rodeo, getting a backstage tour of Dr. Diabolicals. Yeah. I mean, who knows? Who knows? Uh, that, uh, <laughs> yeah, but who knows? I mean, who knows? We may have even some more people on, on the trip. trip. Who knows? And maybe some vlogs coming from, from it, but... Hmm. You'll just have to wait and see. That's like Stay tuned. Yeah, no, that's getting close. Like, what is it? It's like one, two, three. That's four months away. Less than four months away is summer. I need some time to reflect on that, Andrew. <laughs> that is insane. I feel like the year, all, like, it's, it's we're already like three months, almost three months into 2022. It is, it's insane. Like, it's insane. I still need some time to com- to to uh, comprehend that we're riding Iron Gwazi right now, and soon it'll be summer. And we'll just be going to so many parks. I mean, I mean, Caleb, but I I am definitely going to so many parks. It is going to be a very packed summer. And... Yes, Andrew, having a big family sucks. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but yeah. Speaking of ooh. Mm, Europe. Huh, huh, hmm, hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Wallaby, Belgium. Yeah, Wallaby, Belgium. Uh, yeah. Caleb, you take this one because I'm not the biggest knowledgeable in this, you know. So I also saw this on a social media post and a so- and a article that we found. Uh, so basically, what's happening is Wallaby, Belgium, has some noise complaints uh, that were filed in. What was it? Back in 2015, I think it was. And so they tried to settle these noise debates with, like, with, you know, things that have, that they've tried. And, but now those legal uh, debates have turned into the fact that now it is illegal in, in that, in that park to run anything that is that is newer than 2015. I think this is kind of ridiculous. Um, I agree. I totally for agree. A park that's gone through so many things, especially they just got, they're still trying to recover from getting flooded a, a while ago. Like, I mean, seriously, this park just keeps on getting hit after hit. I know. Like, this park has been through so much. Like, I cannot imagine, like, Floods and even all of this, like I bet Conda's having a bad time. I mean, I I feel like Conda's become like now becoming a rare credit. You know, like I feel like if you rode it, like it, it's really becoming a rare credit. And I'm not sure if it's the best ride. Uh, I mean, it was really good, but like I wouldn't think people would. I don't. I haven't. From what I've heard, people have not necessarily ranked it like as high as like you know like even like in the top five range, but. Or it's top probably, three range, but it's like probably top like twenty range. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, something like I don't know, like it's it's up there for sure. But I haven't heard like it's the best. But moving on to our next segment, we have the ride rankings, and for the ride rankings in today's episode, we will be doing the top ten Florida. Roller coasters. Yes, you heard that correctly. We are ranking our top 10 in Florida. In our state. Okay. So, how are we going to be doing this ranking? Uh, we're going to be starting out with... Uh, we're going to be doing it all different from the past episodes. Both of the past episodes have been more scrambled, you know? Um, like... We're still trying to get this podcast together. Yeah, uh, obviously with the first episode, uh, we, it didn't rankings didn't necessarily go as planned. Uh, That's the point of this whole podcast, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, technically Andrew? it's unscripted, but... And then last episode, Caleb wasn't here, so now we're finally able to be back here and, you know, try to do this ride ranking as on point as we possibly can. 
definitely with the format, we are trying to improve on this, but we're going to start at the ranking about now, starting out with my number 10. My number 10 is Kraken. Kraken, located at Seward, Orlando, is such a good coaster. I feel like sometimes it gets some unnecessary hate. Some people think it has a rattle. Everything about it, some people just don't like. I, I really like what Seward has been doing recently with this coaster. The repaint looks absolutely fantastic and really this coaster when it's running good it really runs good um it has some great inversions those inversions can really elevate this ride and the near misses if you can not really near misses but like the way it goes underground some of the elements really in my opinion are just great but caleb what's your number 10 my number 10 is shikra at bush gardens tampa so this is a dive coaster by bnm and I personally think it's very underrated here in the coaster community as, you know, people's people just hate on dive coasters because they're one-trick ponies, but I think it is a very good trick, and Shikra is, you know, one of the... It was the first dive coaster here in America, and I personally rank it over coasters such as Valraven, which is the only other dive coaster I've been on by B&M. Uh, but in that case, um, Shikra is a very good i think it's a very excellent coaster i had it ranked up super high for a long time unfortunately i've ridden other coasters and have had better opinions on others and as i've ridden more and gotten more experience you know it, it drops down but it still found a spot in my top 10 and i think it is fantastic because that first drop in the back row is so good the, the flow ejector going down that drop down that 200 foot 90 degree plunge and then the Immelman that follows right after is super forceful and then every just the rest of the ride feels so complete for a dive coaster even though it's it feels shorter than like say Valraven but it just feels like it's so much more to it just because of those restraints make the difference for me yeah so, moving on to our number 9. I know Caleb's going to be a little disappointed in this, but my number 9 coaster in Florida is Cheetah Hunt, located at Busch Gardens, Tampa. Uh, I love Cheetah Hunt. This was the coaster that got me into coasters. It has some great moments to it, such as the drop, like the whole off the top hat. The whole top hat is really fun, and the launches are fantastic. It has one good airtime moment, and honestly... Uh, Cheetah Hunt is one of my favorite family coasters. It has so many great elements, and everything about it is very enjoyable. It was the first coaster that I did with the inversion, and I really love this coaster. It definitely is a very memorable uh, p uh, piece of my memory, so to say. So, Caleb, what's your number nine? My number nine is Hollywood Brick Ride Rocket at Universal Studios. Boo! So, this is a love it or hate it type of ride. I love it, especially night rides during Hall Halloween Horror Nights are just the best rides on this thing. The last ride I had on it was super smooth. It was hauling the whole way. It was super forceful. You know, it had great pops of ejector going into a lot of those brake runs. You know, some people say, you know, the brake runs take away from the ride. I think it adds to it because there are some great moments of airtime coming in and out of those. And mm -hmm. I just feel like the layout and the music... The music especially is add just adds on to the ride for me, especially where I can choose some of my favorite songs, such as Paralyzer uh, or Rainbow Connection by the Muppets. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, uh, 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 Disney uh, Disney property at Universal. Continue. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, I just think that this ride is super underappreciated in the coaster community, and I think it is getting a little bit more love now uh, than it used to. Even though it's not that good. And people are starting to realize um, how good it is. I mean, at least I don't have a coaster that is one of the worst rides in the universe on my top ten at Florida. <laughs> at, at least, you know, but... One moving of the worst rides at Universal is Fast and Furious. Yeah, no, 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 no. Fast and Furious is better than Hollywood Red Rocket. No. Okay, I won't go that Don't far. I, I won't go that, that far. far. <laughs> I won't go that far. But moving on to the number eight, we have my number eight. This is a new for 2022 coaster that just recently opened. This is 
Iron Quasi. No, I'm joking. Icebreaker. Located at Sioux in Orlando. This coaster, when I first got off it, I was stunned. It is such a good ride. It has so many good surprising elements to it. And honestly, it's such a good family coaster. I know they moved up the height requirements, so it's not really a family coaster anymore. But this coaster is very fun. So many good airtime moments. Uh, it's just glossy smooth. Uh, I'm a big fan of Icebreaker, and hopefully I get to ride it more and more as times come. Caleb, what's your number eight? So my number eight is Montu at Bush Gardens, Tampa. And I know this is a controversial pick, especially for this low on my list. However, um, I just, I don't know. I want to move Montu higher. I super badly wanted to. However, I just couldn't. Like, it was super, super hard making this list. And, you know, Montu is so fantastic. Such a great invert. Um, it's my second favorite invert behind Afterburn. Um, it's super whippy, super forceful, you know, such a good invert. However, I just couldn't move it up higher because there are so many more coasters in Florida that are so much better, in my opinion, and that I've had better experiences on than Monsu. But also another coaster at Busch Gardens Tampa is taking my number seventh. That is Kumba, located at the back of the park of BGT. Um, definitely one of the best sit-downs by B&M out there. Uh, I know there's not that much, but it's definitely one of the best ones. I love this ride. It has so many great inversions. It is so intense. There's so many good intense moments to it. And ever since I rode this for the first time, I have absolutely adored this ride. It's been one of my favorite rides. Uh, the color scheme is fantastic. And everything about this ride is great. I know it not be may not be super good for some people, um... Definitely not for some people, but uh, it, it's good. I, I really like Kumba, and uh, the inversions, everything about it is fantastic. So, Kayla, what's your number seven? So, my number seven is Mind Blower at Fun Spot Kissimmee. And, you know, this is another one that's love it or hate it. I personally don't mind rough, rough roller coasters. Um, so, Mind Blower is right up my alley. Is you know, there's some great moments of airtime on, not great, fantastic moments of airtime on there. And the inversion is probably one of the smoothest parts of the ride. And, you know, you could get this ride on a smooth day or a bad day. You know, it all depends on what day you ride and how good it's running that day. If you really love it or you really hate it, you know, you know, I rode it on both types of days. And, you know, I feel like even on the better day, it wasn't running as fast. But, I mean, the only rides I've gotten it are in the morning and with Andrew. But, yeah. He can attest to that, that uh, that the rides we got were, it was running pretty slow. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But it still is elite even when running slow, though. Yeah. I mean, if you call it elite, whatever you want to say, but yeah. Moving on, uh, we have a coaster that we just rode last night. That is Incredible Hulk. Incredible Hulk, the experience with this coaster is breathtaking. It is my favorite sit-down, B&M sit-down in the world. Better than Wildfire, better than Kumba. I know it's a controversial opinion that it's better than Kumba, but recently this thing has popped up over that. So uh, everything about this ride is fantastic. That first half is is almost unbeatable for the type of ride that it is. It has a fantastic first inversion with that launch, and the start to this ride is absolutely fantastic. But throughout the ride, you are accompanied by that soundtrack, which is probably the best on-ride soundtrack of all time. I mean, I don't even know what like, compares with it. And honestly, everything about The Incredible Hulk is absolutely fantastic. Universal keeps coming in clutch with these fantastic, I mean, I mean fantastic coasters. And hopefully... Just maybe there'll be another one. We'll have to see. Caleb, what's yours? So my number six is another ride in the same park as Hulk. And just as he was talking about, it's another clutch edition by Universal that's recent. Although it might trigger some of you people because some of you will probably have this coaster higher. Um, it's Haggard's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure. Uh, so this ride, uh, I just... just I don't like the style of ride that it is. That's why I rank it lower. 
than most people would. I mean, some people say it's some of the most is one of the most fun coasters that they've ridden. I I personally just don't like the style and like I like more thrilling coasters like you've seen on this list. I mean, Hagrid's still fits in number six on my list. However, I just feel like Hagrid's is just. You know, I wanted it to be more thrilling. I wanted that last launch to last just a little bit longer. And if it had a little bit more elements through that third most powerful, or the, not the third, but the last launch, then it would definitely be higher on this list. However, I just, I just can't. Okay, but I think coming in a very similar coaster... Uh, coming out at my number 5 spot, I think this is very similar to Hagrid's, and that is Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure, <laughs> located at Islands of Adventure. Uh, can I be kind of recapped there? Uh, even though I really like this ride, uh, I would definitely not say it's bad. <laughs> not bad, but like, I really love this coaster. This is one of my all-time favorite family coasters. Honestly, it's probably my favorite family coaster out there. Uh, Cheetah Hunt's definitely not better than it. Uh, Haggard's is so much better than Cheetah Hunt. Uh, but... Ha ha ha, we're foreshadowing. Ha ha ha, but yeah. Uh, Haggard's, uh, it's, it's such fun every time. It's, I feel like if you're in Florida, it's something that you don't really experience, like, with all the, any of the other Florida coasters. I feel like it's something that's different than the others. I feel like every time you go there, you're like, oh, it's a new type of ride experience, and I just... Really love ha like the way Haggard's does stuff. Sure, some of the screens and animatronics may be a little cheap, but the whole experience through that thing is there, and it is definitely worth a long wait if you have to do so while you're at Islands of Adventure. But Caleb, what is your number five? So my number five coaster is Manta, and I know I might get some flack for putting Haggard's below Manta, but hear me out here. The one element that makes this ride, this ride, is that pretzel loop. Oh my gosh, that pretzel loop on Manta is just so good. I value intensity and I value the factor of intensity a lot more than I, fact, than I, than I do fun factor. And that's why Manta is above Hagrid's for me. But that pretzel loop is just what makes the whole entire ride. And the other inversions are great. Um, I think the feeling of flying is one of my most favorite feelings on a roller coaster. Uh, I'm definitely a sucker for flying coasters, as if you look on my rankings, uh, you can definitely see that I love me my flying coasters. <laughs> yeah, I mean, flying coasters aren't my personal type of ride, but I know Caleb loves them, and they are really good. Just wait, Caleb, just wait till you get on Tatsu. Oh my god. Gosh, that is going man, to just, be a good experience. <laughs> I just can't wait to do that one, although it might be a while before I actually get to do that one. Just might be a while. But or Flying Dinosaur. Or Flying... Oh, man. That is... So, that looks so good. I uh, every, every element on Flying Dinosaur just looks absolutely insane. Like, there's that one element that's like a double... Tw I don't know what it is. It is... Uh, I'm just... I just want to ride that so bad. Uh, all of Japan just looks absolutely insane, but... Moving on, we have our number four spot in the rankings. My number four, I know, it's no different than Caleb's, but my number four is Montu. My personal favorite, BNM Invert. Such, such a good ride. Montu is one of my all time favorites. Everything about it is fantastic. As you dive through the trenches, it is a whippy ride. So intense. The Batwing is fantastic. And it is overall. My favorite invert. Uh, I feel like a lot of people really could agree with me there. Uh, definitely not Kayla, but <laughs> he was like Afterburn, right? I like Afterburn I like better. Afterburn better, yes. I feel like the elements on Afterburn are definitely a lot more whippy, in my opinion. Towards the back and rows, either one works left or right. I mean, yeah, I don't blame you, but I personally like Manchu uh, just a tiny bit better. But Manchu's great. I absolutely love this thing. Uh, before Iron Gwazi was there, I definitely thought it was the best ride there. But since Iron Gwazi is there, Bush Gardens really has a incredible top three. Uh, maybe not as good as some other parks, but it's still just incredible with two fantastic old school B&Ms and of course uh, a brand new RMC that's absolutely incredible. But Caleb, what's your number four? Staying with the Bush Gardens theme, uh, I'm going 
to put my number four as Cheetah Hunt at Bush Gardens. And so some of you again, my my picks are not are pretty controversial uh, for coaster enthusiasts. Andrew's is more traditional coaster enthusiast. Mine is my opinion coaster enthusiast. <laughs> Yes, definitely his opinion. Even though I've been on like six hundred coasters, <laughs> but I guess you could call it traditional more of like in general when you've ridden six hundred coasters. But carry on. <laughs> so Cheetah Hunt, the reason why I love it so much is because this was actually like this was again the coaster that got me into coasters. Although I think it was Rock and Roller Coaster that really has that title for me. But Cheetah Hunt was really my first like big coaster outside of a Disney park. So before I went to Busch Gardens for my first time, I think it was in 2018 that I went for my first time. And on that trip, the first ride we went to was Cheetah Hunt. And so that got me prepared for the rest of the day ahead. And I was actually somewhat terrified of roller coasters by that point. But I feel like Cheetah Hunt really warmed me up to the rest of the coasters at Busch Gardens. And also, I feel like Cheetah Hunt has three fantastic launches. Uh, that third one, especially into that ejector moment airtime hill, if you can find a way to get a lot of room, like I do on almost every single ride, and Andrew can attest to how much room I get on Cheetah Hunt. Yes, that's <laughs> a pure fact. <laughs> I find a way with these intimate restraints to find them to be one of the worst to, in my opinion, being some of the best. And, you know, that ejector hill after that third launch is my favorite part of the ride. It is so good, especially with the amount of room. You literally go flying. And I mean flying. You're up there for a good solid four seconds of ejector. I, I, feel, mean, I feel like that type of airtime hill is kind of like a patented intimate bullets type of element. I mean, you've seen that on Cheetah Hunt. Uh, Maverick. I'm not sure if it's anywhere else. Lost a coaster. No, not really. The launch into the top hat. But I don't know, like that type of airtime. Like, if y'all are listening, I think you would know what it is. But like, you know, there's that one tiny airtime hill on Maverick and Cheetah Hunt. That obviously speaking, like after that third launch, uh, just think of that, and you could think of what it looks like on Cheetah Hunt. Uh, not Cheetah Hunt, but what it looks like on Maverick. In those hills, pack a punch. I love those type of hills. I don't know why. Like ever since I've like first rode Cheetah Hunt, that's probably my, my favorite ride of the part of the ride too. Um, uh, obviously Caleb's uh, favorite part of the ride too. But um, let's move on to the top three. And our top threes are pretty similar. Yeah, I think we're gonna do something. Where we're just gonna go from three to one. All right, Caleb, what's our number three? What is my number three? My number three is Mako. And my number three is Mako. My number two is Velocicoaster. My number two is Velocicoaster. And my number one is Air Grover. And my number one is Iron Gwizzy. Okay, not Air Grover. I'm, of course, I'm joking, but Iron Gwazi. Of course, the number one. The king of Florida roller coasters. What else would it be? But, I mean, Velocicoaster definitely puts up a test, uh, a challenge to it, but... That's the top three. Uh, I feel like there's not that much to talk about throughout those. Everybody knows right. what they are. I mean, come on. What can't be said about those that have had that has not have already been said? I mean, Mako just is the best B&M hyper, in my opinion. Delivers some fantastic floater. Uh, Velocicoaster is just Velocicoaster. And Iron Gwazi is an RMC hyper hybrid. Need I say more? Yeah, we are spoiled. I feel like this whole top ten just accompanies the idea of Florida Coast Enthusiast being spoiled. I mean, you have all these fantastic coasters, and then you have the theming of Disney World, all of the rides in Universal, and, of course, the go-kart's a fun spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We have fun spot in our minds because we just went to fun spot. Fun spot. With their go-karts, their go-karts. I know, Caleb, you're not the biggest fan. Or are you? I Anna. am, actually. I love go-karting. Did you Especially like the go karts? How aggressive you can be on those go karts. Yes, Fun Spot. What you know? How Fun Spot has the motto of safe, clean, fun. Yeah, I, on I, the go karts, the clean and safe part of it goes away. Yeah, I feel like their motto should just be fun. fun. <laughs> yeah, fun. <laughs> like yesterday, I mean, it's since it's Fun Spot, they're not the safest nor the cleanest. So there's that. But 
obviously, like, oh, man. Like, the go-kart's a fun spot. I love, especially uh, since we went to Fun Spot Orlando, the go-karts there are insane. They have the Thrasher course, which might just be my number one now since I've rewritten both of my t- top two. But there's the Thrasher one and the Conquest one. Uh, the Conquest one has this really big drop, but still... Or not still, but now, probably my favorite is Thrasher. What was your favorite, Caleb? My favorite was probably the uh, Conquest, I would say. Just because it felt bigger. I like whenever go to car tracks are bigger, and they feel like they go on forever. Especially that one uh, hill in, in uh, you get airtime. Conquest. I mean, it depends on... You, know, <laughs> you get airtime on go-karts. I mean, you, 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 do. Might, you might get a little bit. Um, it's go-karts anything's their time <laughs> yeah, yeah but you go speeding down that hill though compared to the rest of the ride and then it, or compared to the rest of the go-karts and then it just it fades away and uh, that kind of sucks yeah that is a that is a go-kart that fun spot i feel like is a place that it's more crowded in the night but i feel like it would be great just to go there during the day when it's not crowded and just marathon the go-karts with your friends uh I feel like that would be like really fun to do. I, I've done that before, and marathon and go karts is so fun. It's absolutely fun, and go karts to me are just fantastic, especially when they're a fun spot when they're not safe. <laughs> fun spot and they're not safe attractions. I mean, what's new? Just to be clear, fun spots attractions are very safe. We're just making jokes of the park. Just take out the safe in their motto. And the clean. They're not clean at all. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of people. A lot, a lot of people. But moving on to our next segment, we have Ride Opinion. And for this Ride Opinion, we are going on a coaster that both of us have ridden. And it is at a, a park that is definitely not the farthest away. It is actually pretty close. Uh, I know some of you may not think this is close, but for us, if we're going to an out-of-state park, it is one of the closest ones we can go to. This coaster is located at Carowinds, and it is Copperhead Strike. Copperhead Strike is such a good coaster, in my opinion. Uh, it made my top 25 just recently, and there's so many good elements to it. Caleb, what do you think about it? I think the best moment on that ride is the ejector death hill, as we or call not, it. Not ejector death hill, this pad did by Airtime thrills, <laughs> but but what we called it, uh, there is that one element at the end, that one airtime hill right before the brakes. We patented that as the death hill. Oh my gosh, that is a perfect description for it. It it, it whips you in, in a ride full of interesting surprises. That last hill is definitely the most surprising part of the ride, in that. That hill catches you off by surprise, even if you've ridden it multiple times. It just every single time hits so hard that you just go flying out of your seat. And it's just a great way to end the ride, full of graceful hang time mostly. Yeah, this and graceful yeah. launches too. Yeah, this coaster has everything you could possibly want it doesn't have the height or speed that's for sure it doesn't have the launches like the good launches but it has fantastic uh, hang time it has some great air time hang time and air time are really the two main focuses but also the inversions uh hang time goes with the inversions i mean they've got the jojo roll you've got that cutback you've got that like especially that first loop that hang time is so good you've got the uh the dive whatever you call it the what's that called Stangle dive, which is so fun. They've got some really intense moments, and the airtime hills are just absolutely lethal. Like the death hill, absolutely lethal. And the theming, even the theming with Cedar Fair, they did a great job with this. The queue and all of that just looks fantastic. I know uh, compared to Disney Universal, definitely not good, but the queue has tons of details, and I really like what they do with Copperhead Strike. Yes, I'd agree with you on the theming aspect of Copperhead Strike. Because I think that this was really the first dip in the water for Cedar Fair besides, you know, maybe like Mystic Timbers or something like that. Or Banshee. Not really, but like kind of, you know. Yeah, I'd say this was Cedar Fair's really, you know, deep dive into theming. You know, they probably saw the effects of theming on this ride and how well it did 
uh, with the general public and how it was really received well because of mainly its theme. And so in the future now, they are they are incorporating more theming than they used to on their rides now because seeing the effects from how this coaster and other coasters such as Mystic Timbers and Orion and other coasters yeah. to come are really doing well because of their theming. Yeah, I feel like I feel like CFR is really setting an example as well. Like with Orion that came in twenty twenty, uh, they added even more theming to that, which is great. And I feel like a lot of parks will try to start incorporating that. I mean, it's really great that now you're seeing parks and or chains such as like Cedar Fair with Orion, now Six Flags with Doctor Die Box Cliffhanger. Uh, they're all adding theming to the rides, which is uh, very gr- very great in my opinion. I feel like. Every coaster's better one has even just the slightest bit of theming, and anything that just makes a coaster look better, just make just really makes the just really improves the ride experience in my opinion. I definitely agree. But uh, with this ride opinion segment, we do have two requirements for it. We have uh, we'll be giving a score and our rank in my rankings. So let's start off with the score. Uh, out of ten, I would probably give Copperhead Strike a nine out of ten. Caleb, what about you? I would give Copperhead Strike a nine and a half out of ten. And I mean, I feel like we both like it pretty equally. It's just, I mean, I would probably give it a nine just because I've ridden more coasters. But like, I Copperhead Strike is fantastic. But for our ranks, it in my top twenty-five out of the six hundred plus coasters that I have ridden, it is number twenty-four. And for a coaster that is not supposed to be like fantastic. Making my number 24 spot is an impressive feat alone. It is great. And in my rankings, Copperhead Strike comes to number 14, which, again, is really impressive considering I've been on now 114 different roller coasters, and it comes out to number 14. Now, there's 100 coasters behind it, even though for Andrew, (laughs) there's like like 600. uh, (laughs) <laughs> about about like five hundred seventy five. <laughs> that just speaks to how good this ride really is, and how underrated it seems to be in the coaster community. Yeah, for me, that is probably the most underrated coaster in all of coasters. I, it's it's just so good, and like it. I know some people would definitely disagree with this, but it comes close to Fury, in my opinion. I mean, not like really close, but I feel like it, it kind of like. Put some pressure on Fury. I don't know. Like, some people might actually... We could see the argument for this being better than Fury. Uh, I mean... I said see the argument, not actually... Like, agree with it, but... Like, hey. But we can see where your argument is coming from, because this ride just is jam-packed with so many good elements. Yeah, I mean, the elements on this thing is absolutely fantastic. But let's move on to our final segment, and that final segment is unpopular opinion this is the third time we've done a popular opinion throughout the podcast but we have some juicy ones let's start off with my unpopular opinion the first unpopular opinion i have is knott's berry farm yes you heard that correctly is better than every six flags park what do you think caleb i think this could actually be justified uh it depends on your it depends on like how you feel about the Six Flags parks. Um, I mean, it again, it depends on your experiences and how you look at them, and you know what type of park you prefer. Honestly, yes, definitely. Uh, for me, the coast, the park that definitely comes the closest in comparison to Knott's Berry Farm or competition that is Six Flags Magic Mountain, which. Uh, Six Flags Magic Mountain, I absolutely love that park. Uh, there's so many good parts about it. But what just comes to mind about Knott's Berry Farm, Knott's Berry Farm is the full package. They have some absolutely fantastic roller coasters in uh, coasters such as Ghost Rider, Fantastic Woody, Best Woody in all of California. Uh, they have Accelerator, which is a fantastic launch coaster. Hang Time, such a good ride. Uh, Solar Boa, a great invert. But that's not all. This park has 
some of the best theming out of any amusement park. They definitely the best theming out of any Cedar Fair park. And all of the areas just intertwined with each other just make this place magical. Almost as magical as Disneyland, which for being a Cedar Fair park, that is a feat, like alone. It is st- like it is incredible on in how something from Cedar Fair could become this magical. And there's places such as Ghost Town and the boardwalk that really make this place just such a lively atmosphere and such a very it's just such a great place to be at and one of the best parks I've ever been to. Now, Caleb, I know we've already gone through this a little bit through the, uh, the previous bit of the podcast, but Caleb, what is your unpopular opinion? My unpopular opinion is that Cheetah Hunt is definitely, in my opinion, the best family coaster. And think about this. He's putting that over Hagrid's, which he, I'm not so sure, but whatever you think, Caleb. Uh-huh. I'm definitely a Cheetah Hunt fanboy. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, you can tell. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, uh, at one point I did have Tigris over it, but then I rode it a couple more times, and the more I ride it, the more I just fall in love with this attraction, and the more I just think that how this is a family coaster is just unbelievable to me, especially with Icebreaker no longer being classified as that, too. Yeah, uh, obviously, as I said earlier, I love Cheetah Hunt. It was the coaster that got me into coasters. A uh, funny story is that when I first rode Cheetah Hunt, I like, I went up to it. I was like, I, I had no idea that there would be an inversion in it. So it was the first coaster that I ever did with the inversion. And I, at the time, I was so scared of inversions. But luckily, uh, I mean, it was the first coaster I ever did with inversions. So, and Cheetah Hunt, I can definitely classify as the coaster that got me into coasters and I am really grateful for that. I know I, f- I feel like throughout the community, Cheetah is a coaster that like really got a ton of people into coasters. It got me into coasters. It obviously, got Caleb into coasters, as you said earlier. Yeah. And it's really gotten a well, ton. I wouldn't say or rock and roller coaster. It got me into bigger coasters. I wouldn't say it got me into roller coasters. That award goes to rock and roller coaster. And I got another funny story about how I got dragged into riding it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. L- listen to this, guys. Listen to this. So, um, I'm kind of embarrassed to tell this story, but, um, so, whenever I went to Hollywood Studios that day to ride Rock and Roller Coaster for the first time, I was about half an inch short of riding Rock and Roller Coaster. So, what my, uh, uh, what my uh, parent does is put like little lifts in your shoes you know those little lifts things that make that help you like help you uh help your foot like be more comfortable in the shoe during the day like if you're getting like i don't know what it could be used for but it's like a little sole that you put inside the shoe that helps you like feel more comfortable and can help you walk more throughout your day and so my dad put one of those to make me about half an inch higher or taller and so whenever we went up to rock and roller coaster i went i i was screaming and crying and i was like telling the ride ops i have lifts in my shoes i'm not tall enough to ride i was like yelling and screaming this whole time then whenever we got up to the ride we boarded our ride vehicle i was nervous as heck to do it because this was my first coaster with inversions and so whenever whenever we got off the ride, the first thing I said was, again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rock and Roll Coaster is a coaster that you will definitely want to do again. I absolutely love this thing. Um, it is, it's so weird for, like, Disney World to have a coaster that, like, goes upside down, like, multiple times. Like, you have coasters, like, the most extreme, like, ones, like, are, like, Everest, but then... Out of the ordinary, you have a coaster such as Rock and Roller Coaster that just, like, launches you in this great launch and goes through, like, so many great inversions in the dark. It is... I love Rock and Roller Coaster. It's such a smooth ride, and everything about that experience, it's just breath. It's just really nice. And I wouldn't say breathtaking, but it's just a really nice experience. Same with everything at Disney. It's almost like in Credit Coaster at DCA, where it's like, you know, where... It's like out of the ordinary. You just have this thrill coaster in the middle of a park where everything else pretty much feels like tame. I know, almost, right? Compared to it. 
Yeah. But I mean, what, I wouldn't call Guardians of the Galaxy exactly. a breakout team, but other than that, you know, everything else feels tame yeah. compared to Incredicoaster. The Guardians is definitely not tame. I will 100% go with that, but like, definitely do, uh, I mean, DCA really is just such a good park. But it feels like, in my opinion, DCA is missing something. Like, uh, I haven't been with the Avengers Campus yet, so maybe that's changed. I would, the last, the first time I went to DCA, and the last time I went to DCA was when Bugs Land was still there. So, uh, it's, yes. been, it's been a while since I've been to California. Oh, oh, also a, co- also a ride that, like, I wouldn't really classify as not thrill. Radiator Springs Racers. And compared to Test Track, that thing feels weak. Uh, I don't know, but like I feel like it's just more a fun ride than Test Track. I yes. I, I I honestly I, like it better than Test Track. I don't think I like it better than Test Track. Um, I think just living in Florida so many years, riding Test Track so many times, riding Radi- Radiator Springs Racers was definitely a uh, a refresh, so to say. It was a surprising change. It was it, it was kind of underwhelming to be honest. Like the uh, the racing portion of it. I'm not talking about the whole ride as the whole ride as a whole. The whole ride as a whole is definitely one of the most breathtaking attractions that I've been on as far as the scenery and as far as the animatronics go, as far as, you know, the storyline behind it. I think th- those are all great, but the racing aspect kind of underwhelmed me. Yeah, I mean it's 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 good. I feel like Ready to Springs Racer is just a coaster, not a coaster. I keep thinking about it being a coaster, but we've talked it's not. coasters this whole time. But here we are talking about a ride that looks like a coaster and it feels like a coaster. But guess what? It's not a coaster. Just like a Super Loop, which is not a coaster. Not a coaster. <laughs> no, it is a. Co- no, I'm sure. <laughs> Next week we should make an episode. Credit or not? Get yeah, credit or not? Oh, that'll be cool. Oh, something about a credit or not? Stay tuned. Stay tuned, stay tuned. With something like, I don't know if I'll classify it as a credit or not, but Seuss Trolley Train. Is that a credit or not? What do you think, Caleb? No. I think it is. But here's the thing. I don't count it as a credit, which is weird. I know it sounds weird. I don't I don't think it's a credit. I, I think it's a credit, but I don't count it. Why don't you think it's a credit, Caleb? I don't think it's a credit because even though it's listed, you know, in the Mac Rides, uh, you know, catalog of roller coasters, as a powered coaster, I don't classify it as a powered coaster because it is not powered by gravity at all during the course. And personally, I've never like ridden a powered coaster yet, <laughs> so I can't really, you know, present the argument. Hey, it's powered coaster credits. I personally don't think so because but, there's no point in the coaster where it's powered by gravity. But are you sure about that? Are you sure there's no part of the coaster that's just downward a little bit? I don't think so. There, all of all of Seuss Trolley Train Ride is powered by electric currents or whatever it's powered by. Yeah, but uh, there, it's it's hard to explain. I I probably will never count it as a credit just because I normally base it my it doesn't feel yeah. like it's a credit at all. The ride experience does not feel like it's a credit. Yeah, at all. but I normally base my credits on if you don't know uh, RCDB. Uh, the roller coaster database. That is what I basically use all of my stuff for. Uh, where I find all the coasters. Roller coaster database really is my friend. Uh, I, I love RCDB. I feel like every every coaster enthusiast just has that one tab open in their computer that they always go to. Uh, RCDB. Uh, they have random roller coaster of the day. Uh, we, this won't be an ongoing thing, but for today, my random RCDB coaster of the day uh, was Mad Mouse at Valley Fair. So. You know, kind of something going along with the Halloween Haunt of Valley Fair. <laughs> but, I mean, it's an RCDB, it's an RCDB ran on the coast of the day, but who knows. Uh, we're definitely going unscripted in this part of the podcast. We're getting towards the end, but... I'm tired. It's like, right now, it's about 3.18 in the morning. We're exhausted. Yeah, we are exhausted, so... <laughs> this has gone on for way too much longer than we expected, I think. Hmm. At least I did. Oh, yeah, at least Caleb did. Uh... But definitely, throughout the next episodes, we have much in plan. But I think that is probably going to be the end to the episode. Uh, uh, it was definitely an eventful episode. Yes, also, it was. Very eventful. Uh, we definitely have more stuff coming. Uh, 
We've got so much stuff planned for the podcast. Definitely y'all should stay tuned. Uh, we've got so much coming. So hope y'all, hopefully y'all enjoyed the podcast. Um, we just hope you'll be here next week and continue watching uh, the rest of the podcast here from Coaster Thrills and Backyard Thrills. So, and hopefully we, next week we won't torture ourselves with four hours of sleep. Hopefully. <laughs> Boy to see, but, but we're going to end this off. I'm your host, Andrew from Coaster Thrills, joined by my co-host. Backyard Thrills or Caleb. Yeah, Caleb from Backyard Thrills. I hope you all enjoyed, and see ya.